Welcome to Profit Boss Radio, where successful women have paved the road to their own financial freedom. Each week, your host, Hillary Hendershot, financial coach, money mindset expert, and experienced wealth manager, will help you discover the keys to the wealth and peace of mind you want and deserve in her no-nonsense and authentic style, starting right now. Welcome to Profit Boss Radio, episode 64. I'm your host, certified financial planner, Hillary Hendershot. Super timely episode for you today. If you are listening to these episodes as they are released, you will be hearing this on April 11th, which in the United States is just before tax day. Actually, this year tax day is on, it's typically on April 15th, but because April 15th happens to fall on a weekend, you have until April 17th, Monday, April 17th, to file your personal tax return unless you are on extension. I'm guessing most of you are not on extension. So for you, I'm sure you'll be thinking about taxes this week. If you didn't file early, most people don't file early. I do know a few people who get on the ball first week of January every year, but that's not the case for most people. And today I have for you an incredible episode called Tax Audit Red Flags and Tax Mistakes You Cannot Make with the IRS. And as our expert, our resident expert today, I have Deborah Gregory. She used to be an IRS tax attorney. So pretty incredible. And I'll get to her full bio I wanted to acknowledge a couple things before we get started. Two episodes ago, I jumped on the mic to record the introduction and I just happened to see on YouTube the Tony Robbins being interviewed and and the name of the interview it was a 12 or 13 minute video interview and it was on his newest book about money and the 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 title or headline for the interview was the fall is coming or the crisis is coming. And I thought, oh gosh, that sounds like the kind of doomsayer stuff that I'm always railing against. So I wonder what Tony's up to here. And I, I mentioned something about it in the introduction. At later that day, I did go back and watch that interview. And it turns out that it was just kind of a dramatic headline to get you to listen. Tony is still telling the passive index investing story. And so, you know, I make I may cover more about his book in later episodes, but not for right now. But yeah, the whole thing about the fall is coming, the crash is coming is just very dramatic language that has people tune in and has people listen to the interview and pick up and read the article. And I don't use that kind of drama in my marketing or copywriting. And I, I just am against it. And truth is, we have no idea if a fall is coming. Of course, there are business cycles and the stock market goes up and the stock market goes down. But these kinds of dramatic headlines just really play on people's fear and the pain. For some people, you know, I'll, I'll even go so far as to call it PTSD from the financial crisis 2007, 2008. The markets just fell precipitously. It was a uh, very emotional time. And so that's still in people's emotional memories. And I don't have any reason to think that anything like that will happen again in our lifetime. So I just don't believe in playing on fear. But so I just wanted to circle back about that. And then for those of you who are in the Profit Boss Facebook group, you know that I actually had a remarkably unexpected and difficult financial event a couple weeks ago on a Tuesday, just after I recorded an episode of Profit Boss Radio. Actually, I got an email from our the property managers who manage the home that my husband and I live in in San Jose, California. And they let us know that the owners of the house that we've been renting from are deciding to have decided to sell the home. So this is actually the third time this has happened to us. We uh, had the day we got notice, we had 60 days to vacate. And, you know, I have a trip to Spain planned in the first of April. So literally, our vacate date was May 20th. And we have a trip to Spain planned on the first two weeks of May. And then I'm attending a conference in the third week of May. The timing just really could not have been worse. And I was really thrown into a bit of a tizzy. I basically spent that night, I took no action that day, spent that night crying and finding solace in tequila. And then the next day I got into action. And we, to make a long story short, 
fully applied for a mortgage, got pre-qualified and then pre-approved for mortgages, and we made an offer on a house. And surprisingly, got an offer accepted. Our very first offer in you know in a in an area where almost all homes have been going with multiple offers and in these sort of drive the offer up kind of scenarios. But we got our first offer accepted. And the really amazing thing is that the house that we actually got into contract to buy is a house, the house that my husband was living in when I met him. And it was a house that has a it's you know it's a it's a nice house and it has a gorgeous gorgeous backyard and pool deck and we have missed that pool deck for years we've talked about it it sort of became the gold standard of pool decks we would you know we would go check into a hotel that had a pool deck and we would say oh but it's not as nice as that pool deck you know in that house you used to live in and so it was pretty amazing when, you know, my husband logged into Redfin and saw that this house had been listed for sale literally the day we got notice to move out. It was hard not to make it mean that it was meant to be. And, you know, it still feels like a miracle. And he and I have a habit of calling houses by the street that they're on. And I said, I don't want to call this house by the street that it's on. I want to call this Miracle House. And so we've been calling it Miracle House. It feels a little goofy, but that's really what it is. And we haven't closed escrow yet. So, you know, even talking about this might be putting the cart before the horse or something like that. But, you know, the work of being able to buy a home really gets done years and years before you ever actually apply for a mortgage or, or buy the home. And so I'll be talking more about the real estate transaction in the episodes to come. And, you know, I have talked before very publicly about how I don't think that buying a home has to be a foregone conclusion. And there are a lot of tax benefits for business owners if you rent a home and you work out of the home. And it it can be flexible and it can give you a lot of freedom and it can, you know, get you into a nice home without having to save you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a down payment. And really, when I tell that story, my intention is to provide freedom for people who maybe aren't in a position to buy a home and make that mean something negative about their own financial capabilities or their worth. And I, I just don't buy into that. And and yet here I am in a situation where I have to admit, having been asked to leave the last three homes that I've lived in unexpectedly and for the same reason, because the owners want to sell the home, absolutely, absolutely absolutely does not work. I mean, you know, I'm lucky to have a business where I have enough flexibility to just pick up and move. But can you imagine if I said to you today, you have 60 days to move? And, you know, it just is like, no choice. No, there's not there's no (laughs) nothing to do to make it easier. You just have to move things around and sprint. And it just was I resented it the whole way through. And I admit I have negative feelings towards the owners, but it's hard because here what they did actually enabled us to buy this home that we have loved and have these amazing memories in. And now we'll be moving back there with our daughter and raising our family there. So um, pretty incredible. So that's the Hillary personal update. Without further ado, I do want to introduce Deborah Gregory. She's my guest today for this tax season timed episode. We're going to be talking about tax audit red flags and the tax mistakes you cannot make. My guest is Deborah Gregory. She worked as a senior tax attorney for the IRS's Office of Chief Counsel for more than 24 years combined in Washington, D.C. and in Dallas, Texas. She served on the International Field Council. She reviewed, negotiated, and settled civil cases before U.S. tax court, and she also provides legal advice on complex domestic and international tax issues to various IRS divisions. She has a very unique institutional knowledge of the IRS. I mean, she must, right? Incredible. It's it's so, I feel so lucky to have a guest with this kind of experience on the show. And I'm really excited about the, the conversation that we did have, because I think you're going to get a lot of clarity about how to avoid getting audited and what to do if you do get audited. Mrs. Gregory truly understands the complexity of your IRS tax problems. And if you are being audited, you may choose to call her and her contact information uh, we'll say at the end, but you can find ways to reach Deborah and her firm, which is in Dallas, Texas, but she says she works everywhere around the world with clients at hillaryhendershot.com forward slash 64. Here's Deborah. 
Oops, I am popping back in here with a little interruption, but it's going to be a valuable one. Someone in the Profit Boss Facebook group suggested that I talk about the marginal tax bracket system. So what is the nature of having marginal tax rates? That's what we have here in the US. And I do see and hear people making logical mistakes when they think about earning income and bringing in more dollars. They think that if they increase their income, that that will be offset by increased marginal tax brackets. And that is just not the case. The deal is marginal tax rate is the rate of tax that you incur on each additional dollar of income. As the marginal tax rate increases, you end up with less money per dollar earned uh, that you had retained on previous earned dollars. So tax systems that employ marginal tax rates apply different tax rates to different levels of income. As income rises, it's taxed at a higher rate. It is important to note, however, that the income is not all taxed at one rate. Instead, it's taxed as at many rates as it moves across the marginal tax rate schedule. So your lowest, your first earned dollars are going to almost always be taxed at the lowest marginal rate. And then as you earn more dollars, dollars in that bracket are going to often be taxed at a higher rate. And let's take the example of if you're earning $120,000 and you're in a system where income at less than $20,000 is taxed at 10% and between 20 and $40,000, it's taxed at 20% and between 40 and $60,000, it's taxed at 30% and between $60,000 and $100,000, it's taxed at 40% and over $100,000, it's taxed at 50%. Now, the logical error I see people making is they think, oh, if I'm making nine $99,000, I'm going to protect myself from that 50% tax bracket, where if I go to $100,000, now my entire income is going to be taxed at 50%, which in the case of if you're making $120,000 would be $60,000. It's not the case. In a marginal tax system, the amount of tax you would actually owe on $120,000 of income is $38,000, not $60,000, because income between zero and $20,000 is taxed at 10%. So the tax owed is $20,000. And then between 20 and 40%, it's taxed at, excuse me, between 20 and $40,000, it's taxed at 20%, which is $4,000, and so on up the scale so that you can see that while, yes, earning additional dollars doesn't give you the same amount of net value, it does not ever result in a net loss to you. So some people believe that marginal tax rates are harmful to the economy because they discourage people from working hard to make more money. That is how a marginal tax system works. If you're in the U.S., that is the tax system that you're taxed under, and that's kind of how that goes. And I took most of this information from an article on investopedia.com written by a Chad Langager or Langager or Langager. I don't know how to say his last name. It is L-A-N-G-A-G-E-R. Thanks, Chad, for your amazing treatment of the marginal tax rate system. Another misconception I think people have is that there is a science or the right way to prepare a tax return. And the truth is that it isn't. That's why someone who prepares taxes is called has a tax practice, just like you have a legal practice. You practice law or you practice tax preparation. It means that it is a lot of science, but part art. And the idea is that you do a fair and reasonable estimate of calculation of what your income tax obligation is based on your financial situation vis-a-vis the IRS tax code. And then you submit it to the IRS and they either audit it or they don't. And if they audit it, they might find mistakes or things that they say are mistakes. But the IRS is always having to issue rulings and make decisions about how things should be taxed given that everyone's financial situation is unique. So there really isn't one way to prepare a tax return except if you are just a a W-2 employee, you have wage income, no bonuses, no commission, no self-employment income, and you do a standard deduction. That's pretty straightforward. There are not a lot, there's not a lot of flexibility or wiggle room there, but for almost every other kind of wage earner, income earner, investor, the tax return is going to possibly look different. So that's why there's so much value in my opinion in having a tax preparer on your team. Okay, let's hear from Deborah. Deborah Gregory, welcome to Profit Boss Radio. Thank you for having me, Hillary. 
Wow. Former IRS attorney sounds so intimidating. How do you end up being an IRS attorney? Go to a lot of scrolling. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know you wanted to be an IRS attorney? No. My now husband, uh, actually a fiance at the time in law school, Garrett, encouraged me to take tax classes. I reluctantly said yes. And I actually, you know, found my love. Uh, you know, my second love, I guess you could say. I've heard that before. I've heard attorneys say that they fell in love with tax law or w with the idea of being a tax attorney. What is it? What does an IRS tax attorney actually do? What's the sort of what's the what's a day in the life like? So I work for the large business international group inside the IRS chief counsel's office. And what we were assigned to do is to help the IRS audit teams, help them with their audits. And once the audit was complete. If there was an adjustment, we would argue the case before IRS appeals. And then if resolution was not, if we couldn't get resolution in appeals, then we could take the case to tax court, U.S. tax court. So we got to wear a number of different hats, but um, mainly we worked with the IRS examination teams and their audits. Okay, so you you used to be kind of, if we had to sort of pit characters in the story, you used to be on the IRS side, so the anti-taxpayer side, or the how to get more money out of taxpayer side, and now you've kind of switched teams? Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> so you... <laughs> no, on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Just like when, you know, a defense attorney might go to work for the public defender's office, and then later they end up as a, a private criminal defense attorney, right? Same kind of career Same. growth. So you reviewed, negotiated, and settled civil cases. And I think people have this idea that they can negotiate their tax bill down. But does that actually happen? What what makes it the most likely that you'll be able to lessen your tax bill through negotiating with the IRS? I, I have to imagine most people don't get to. Is that right? Correct. The IRS does not accepts less than a half of the offering compromises they receive every year. And really, you know, bottom line is if you can full pay your tax liability, the IRS is not going to work with you. And it, it's a calculation. It's not a used car lot sales negotiation. What the IRS looks at is your income, your expenses, and your net equity and assets. And what they're looking at is your ability to pay over the life of the statute of limitations, which is 10 years from the date of assessment. And the assessment date is going to be close in time to when either you filed a return or the IRS created a return for you under their substitute for return procedures. Okay. So okay. don't enter into life or your financial life thinking, well, I can incur, incur a tax bill and it can just sit there or I, I might get it, be able to get it wiped off the books. I mean, I think there are a lot of probably fraudulent people out there saying we can help you, you know, save tens of thousands of dollars on your taxes. And that's just all kind of nonsense, right? It's Well, there are a lot of misleading, you know, radio ads and TV commercials. We've been very successful in, in getting offers submitted to the IRS, but it's because we do understand that it is, it is a calculation and that not everyone is going to qualify for it. And so taxpayers really just need to be realistic in, you know, dealing with the IRS and submitting an offering compromise. I mean, you're not going to be able to keep your Highland Park house and your Maserati. All right. <laughs> You've got to, you need to be in a place where you're not financially able to full pay the liability over the life of the statute of limitations. Got it. Okay. Do you have an opinion about whether people should use TurboTax or whether they should hire a professional tax preparer? You know, we see a lot of clients who have used TurboTax and they've inadvertently made a mistake and then they get audited because of that. And so, you know, I always think that it's a good idea to use a tax return preparer unless you have just a plain vanilla tax return, maybe just a W-2 standard deduction. And I, I kind of agree. And I, I, I thought you might say that because I just think it's so can have so much value to have a, a human being looking at your tax return saying, yes, this is probably going to pass the sniff test with the IRS. Although, Absolutely. yeah, the if you just have W-2 income, then it makes it pretty straightforward and probably not a huge reason to invest in that. So, Deborah, what are, in your opinion, what are the tax mistakes that people just cannot make? Well, there are a number of mistakes that we see our clients make, and one of the top ones is not making estimated tax payments. Okay. You know, taxpayers have to pay taxes that 
on income that they receive during the taxable year, either through withholding or estimated tax payments. Usually those who have 1099 income or other kind of business income that's not subject to withholding is in this category. And it's imperative to make those estimated tax payments because you're going to get hit one with a penalty if you don't. And two, what we see almost every single day is clients who don't make estimated tax payments are going to end up owing the IRS money. And now they're in a really financial bind because they didn't appropriate appropriately allocate that money to taxes. And now they have a tax bill and they have to figure out you know, how they're going to resolve that with the IRS. It can get pretty painful pretty quickly if you go a couple, a year or two without withholding enough money to pay the IRS. And now you're in debt to the IRS. I always say to people, you can be in debt to the credit card company. You can be in debt to your parents, to the bank, but the IRS is not an organization you want to be in debt to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you They're have to the stay on the ball. Predator in the world. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Other tax mistakes you can't make? Well, we see all the time our clients who owe the IRS back taxes and they ignore the IRS. They'll ignore the notices. They won't open the mail. And that's just not a very good strategy. The IRS, like we said, is is very powerful creditor. They can love your bank accounts. They can garnish your wages. They can file a notice of federal tax lien against your real and personal assets. They can seize your assets and they can revoke your passport. So, Ignoring the IRS is just not a good strategy. Folks who owe the IRS really need to be proactive in dealing with the issue and and getting into a resolution with the IRS. I do literally know people who have had money just removed from their bank account by the IRS. Yes. And we get calls like that frequently. (laughs) Yeah. Times a week, for sure. (laughs) Really? Other mistakes? A lot of times people make the mistake of either prepared the return themselves or had someone else prepare their return. They see that they owe, they can't pay, so they decide not to file the tax return. And that's a huge mistake because the failure to file penalty is generally more than the failure to pay penalty. Wow. So if, wow. You, if you can't pay all the taxes that you owe, you should, should pay as much as you can and then work out a resolution strategy with the IRS. Got it. More other mistakes? Well, I mean, we see this all the time is we have clients who are under audit and they just didn't keep good books and records. And when you don't keep books and good books and records and you're brought up for an audit, then you can't substantiate your return position. So the auditor is going to disallow any of your expenses that you can't substantiate. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so it's just a good practice to keep good books and records for a number of reasons. Um, Notwithstanding an audit, you really need to monitor the progress of your business, you know, be able to prepare a financial statement if you need that, and really identify your sources of income and keep track of your expenses. Just, you know, see if there's a category of expense that's not in alignment with your income. So, It's just imperative for business owners to keep good books and records for a number of reasons, but certainly for purposes of defending your tax return upon audit. So just to make it real for people, being able to defend your expenses or your deductible expenses or keeping good records would be doing things like having a bookkeeping tool. So using Quicken and categorizing your expenses. I'm sorry, it would be QuickBooks or, or FreshBooks and categorizing your expenses, but drilling down to really keeping the receipts, right? Correct. And literally for if you're going to expense a lunch, if you take a client out to dinner, you put that client's name on the receipt and take a picture or keep a scan of that receipt, right? Absolutely. And you need to notate not only who you took with you to you know lunch or dinner, but notate what you discussed at that luncheon. Oh, okay. So specifically how it relates to your business. Correct. And Correct. even though meals and entertainment are not 100% deductible, I think they're only 50% deductible. Right. But I, I do think that's probably the most frequent thing happening for a business owner is, is the expensing of things like meals and gifts and entertainment. Correct. Uh, and, you know, and we, we can talk about that a little later, but I mean, that is 
is one of the audit red flags. So mm-hmm. um, it's just really good to keep books and records with respect to some of those items that we know are going to be audited. So I let my private Facebook community of Profit Boss listeners know that I was interviewing you today. And that really was the top question that came up is, I think the IRS audit is this looming dreadful event and people don't understand how audits happen, how people get selected for audits, and what really happens if you do get an audit. So could we talk a little bit about that process and then let us know what are the things the IRS looks for when it decides to audit somebody? Absolutely. For the most part, audits are random audit. It, it's, it's random, but the IRS does assign what's called, it's called a diff score. And it, it basically scores your return in relation to other returns based on what you put on the return. And no one really knows, you know, the code for, for the diff score. It's, it's kind of like the Google algorithm. No one really knows what it is, but we have some ideas based on, you know, now working outside the IRS, what the IRS is looking for. And one of the things that that we see all the time in our practice is Schedule C audits. And what the IRS is looking for is travel expenses, car and truck expenses, other, and that meals and entertainment that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And if those items are high, you will likely get picked up for an audit. Got it. So they're looking at kind of an um, an average of, let's say you're a service corporation and you have $150,000 in revenue and they take sort of a mean average. What do service corporation owners typically deduct on these various expenses? And if you're way out in the stratosphere, then that's a red flag. Correct. And, you know, and they're also going to look at income. I mean, they, they challenge gross receipts frequently you know, they're going to do a bank account analysis for the Schedule C business owner just to see if they reported all of their gross receipts for the year. Oh, to make sure no one's hiding income. Correct. Ah, okay. Now, my I was mentored into the financial planning business by my father, and he had some of these cute quotes he would say all the time. And he would say, underreporting income is a slammer offense. <laughs> and <laughs> and that, he basically was saying it's better to report the income and not pay the tax than it is to not report the income because the IRS takes that very seriously. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Good advice. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Uh, you have to know, you have to know which, uh, which, which fights you're willing to take on in life. So far, fighting the IRS is not, not a fight I'm willing to, to step into. I'm not willing to step into that ring. So I make sure to do the right thing. Other red flags that you know about or that you see often? Unreimbursed employee expenses. And that's a huge audit red flag because the bottom line is employers are not going to ask employees to incur expenses and not get reimbursed for it. Mm -hmm. And the IRS knows that. And, you know, we see a lot of that either with someone did TurboTax and they, you know, inadvertently put, you know, an expense on unreimbursed employee expenses like commuting miles, Mm -hmm. which is not an allowable expense. You cannot deduct your commute miles as an employee. Correct. Yeah. Nor can you, I think there's some idea that people can deduct the clothing that they wear, but that's only if it's a uniform, right? Exactly. And then even in that case, the uniform is typically provided by the employer. Exactly. Okay. And so, so we see that a lot, you know, folks will inadvertently put, you know, their commuting mileage, they, they won't, they just don't know that it's not a deductible expense and, and they'll put it under unreimbursed employee expenses. And that's, you're going to get picked up for audit. Don't do that. Audit red flag. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you do get the dreaded audit letter, you get notified by a letter from the IRS, right? Correct. And then what's the process after that? I The first thing I would do is call my tax preparer, but I just happen to work with someone who I know has been through audits with his clients. I think most people have no idea whether the person who prepared their tax return can or would help them or what to even do next. How does that process go? Right. So if you do get the letter notifying you that you're under audit, then the first thing I would do is, you know, either call your tax return preparer or call, you know, a local tax attorney to help you with the audit. Some CPAs and enrolled agents do handle audits, but some of them don't. Some of them don't do controversy work. 
And so, you know, I would encourage everyone to look for a, a tax attorney. Also, the good thing about having a tax attorney is you have the attorney client privilege. What the auditor is looking for is they're going to identify, like we said before, a couple of the line items. If it's a Schedule C audit, they're going to look at like, you know, a couple of items, other expenses, meals and entertainment, maybe the mileage, because those, like I said before, are audit red flags. They're going to ask the taxpayer to provide documentation to support their return position. And this could go on for a while. And once the audit is complete, the IRS examiner can either agree with the return position, in which case the taxpayer would get a no change letter, meaning there's no changes to the return, they're done with the audit, or the taxpayer could get a letter describing the proposed changes that the auditor makes. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for everyone to understand that the IRS auditor is not the final judge of the case. He or she is, is making a proposed adjustment and the taxpayer does have a right to protest his or her case to IRS appeals. And IRS appeals is an independent group inside the IRS whose main function is to resolve cases. And, you know, it's my experience working both inside the IRS and now outside the IRS. IRS appeals is more of a taxpayer friendly venue. Really? It's, yes. And you know, they're just, they're a little more amenable to working out the case, meaning if the, the client, for example, uh, doesn't have every single receipt, but they have their bank records and credit card statements and they can delineate the expense categories and it all matches the return, you know, it's not the best evidence, but it's the second best evidence. And appeals will more than likely accept that. So, you know, if you do get selected for audit, you do have another avenue to have someone independent look at your case to see if they agree or disagree with the proposed adjustments by the IRS auditor. Okay. Now, is there an average dollar amount that audits cost taxpayers? I have to imagine not many audits come up with a zero dollar price tag, right? Because then the IRS is just sort of spinning its wheels. Well, I mean, meaning... Well, in they, other words, yeah, so you come out of the audit process and then the IRS says to you, you know, we believe you owe X dollars in addition to what you've already paid. Is there an average dollar amount or is it just really all over the map? I mean, it has to be sometimes huge for some business owners. Correct. We work audits uh, routinely here in our office and we've gotten no change letters and then we've gotten letters to our clients saying that there's proposed adjustment. So it depends on each case. And, you know, people need to understand that the IRS auditor is, you know, their main function is they want to really close the case. And so they're going to pick a couple of the large items on the return. And if the taxpayer cannot substantiate it, then they're going to close the case, make a proposed adjustment. And then the taxpayer can protest the case to IRS appeals. Got it. Now, in your experience, just to set expectations, should Every American expect to be audited once in their lifetime, or, or do some go through the whole, their whole life and never get audited? Well, like I said before, it, it's a random process. You know, I think there's some taxpayers who are going to have higher diff scores. I mean, business owners that are Schedule C's will definitely at some point get well, not definitely, but more than likely <laughs> get picked up for an audit, whereas perhaps a wage earner who is subject to withholding, has a standard deduction, Right. that's not really anything the IRS is going to look at. There's no room really for great abuse with that tax return. So then if you are a business owner and you get audited and it looks to the IRS like you are maybe an abuser of the tax code, like you just, you, you didn't have good bookkeeping, you weren't substantiating things, you maybe hid some income, do you then get on kind of their bad people list and probably get audited again? If normally what we see is if you get selected for one year and there's proposed adjustments, the IRS auditor is going to pick up two more years. So they'll pick up three years for audit. Got it. So you definitely want to, you know, put your best case forward when you initially get picked up so that you can, you know, wrap up the case and not have other years included in the audit. Got it. 
Okay. Well, is there anything I've missed as we approach tax time here? This episode is going to air on April 11th. And so, you know, I know taxes are going to be on people's minds. Is there anything top of mind for you that I forgot to ask about? You're the expert. No, I just, you know, if if you owe, my big thing is, you know, if you owe taxes to go on and file the return on time and then figure out, you know, a resolution strategy with the IRS because you're going to end up owing less over the long term. So stay in communication, do the right thing. Even if the money isn't there to pay the tax bill, let the IRS know where you're at and then work it out from there. Correct. Okay. Now you are in Dallas as a, you're working as a tax attorney. So you are arguing these audit cases with, with the IRS on behalf of your clients. Is that right? Correct. And do people need to live in Texas to work with you? Oh no, we, we have cases actually all over the world. Oh really? Uh, Thank goodness for technology. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, exactly. So who's the right kind of client for you? We're a boutique tax law firm. We handle domestic and international tax issues in really all phases of the audit appeals and collection process. We do have a number of international issues with respect to disclosing offshore bank accounts. Garrett and I were on the International Tax Council for the IRS. So We are adamantly familiar with the international tax laws as they apply to both expats of the United States and then those who live in the United States and are from other countries. So we have a a good base of, of representing folks on both domestic and international tax issues. Okay. And how can, how can people contact you? They can call us toll free at 888-346-5470 or they can find us on the web at gregorytaxlaw.com. And that's Gregory with one G, right? Correct. Okay, great. And then if you're listening to this on the subway or in traffic, you can, as always, find the contact information Deborah just mentioned at hillaryhendershot.com forward slash 64. Deborah, it's been fantastic and super timely to have you on the show. I just really appreciate your expert opinion, helping people navigate those tax waters. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. Profit Boss, thanks for making it to the end of another episode of PBR. I have been doing a lot of thinking about you. I'm thinking about how hard it can be to change old habits. I mean, sometimes I think how nice it would be if things worked like they did for Keanu Reeves in those Matrix movies. If we could just lie back in an industrial punk rock barber chair and have a little cable plugged into the backs of our necks and just instantly become the masters of our financial domains. That would be kind of perfect, right? Except for the part about having the cable plugged into the back of your neck and the whole industrial punk thing. And Keanu Reeves is so annoying when you get right down to it. But I think it's important to form new habits, especially ones as fun as being alerted when new episodes of Profit Boss Radio go live. You want to know a secret? This is one habit that's almost no work at all. All you have to do is head over to iTunes, find the Profit Boss Radio channel, and hit subscribe. That's it. Then each week, you'll automatically find the latest episode ready and waiting on your favorite device. And the best part is that subscribing to Profit Boss Radio is just the beginning of other wonderful habits, like taking control of your money and learning how to build wealth or starring in your own reality show. Well, maybe not that one, unless it's on YouTube and self-produced. But plenty of great stuff is sure to happen when you subscribe. So what are you waiting for? Thank you for listening to Profit Boss Radio, where creating success on our own terms happens every day. You're not alone in your journey to a rich life, and that's why Hillary is here to add value in each and every episode. See you next time on The Podcast for Women and Money.